Hello. Uh, welcome to the seminar today. I'm glad to see that we have such a good crowd, given that so many people went down the western side of naturalists this afternoon. It's, it's nice to see the hardcore ecologists stay here. <laughs> and uh, today we're uh, fortunate to have uh, Dr. Laura Rogers Bennett uh, come and talk to us. And uh, Laura received her uh, PhD in ecology at uh, UC Davis, then did a postdoc um, at UC Santa Cruz, and also up at uh, UW's uh, Friday Harbor Marine Lab. And Laura's a senior scientist at um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife now, and uh, has been uh, doing a lot of good research up out of the Bodega Marine Lab for uh, many years on a variety of uh, invertebrates uh, and has, I don't know if you still, I'm, I presume you still are heavily involved in the abalone work um, and, um, and of course urchins. And um, She's going to uh, talk to us today about marine heat wave impacts on bull kelp forest ecosystems in Northern California, so I'm really looking forward to that. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Well, thank you, Rick, and thank you for the invitation to come and speak at uh, Moss Landing. It's one of my favorite places here, and we have Martin Go here, who's been working closely with us in our lab up north and here, so it's a real pleasure to, to be here and get to talk with you today. Uh, today I'm going to tell you a story about um, marine monitoring and being out there underwater and seeing what the ecosystem looks like and doing that for a number of years now um, and then all of a sudden have something big that comes about and changes everything and without having had that uh, baseline uh, we really wouldn't be able to tell the story that we can tell now so um, I'm just putting in a plug for any kind of baseline monitoring, whether it be uh, baseline monitoring for the genetics of organisms before a major mortality event, or whether it's uh, what we do, which is counting and measuring things underwater. Uh, these kinds of things and data, these long time series are critical to what we do, and they're going to become even more critical in this time of climate change. So. I'm going to give you a story of climate change uh, that's right out um, in front of our, in our backyards. And um, so here we go, sipping from a fire hose, as my dad would like to say. So um, anytime you work in the water, uh, on the boats, um, especially underwater, you don't do it by yourself. Um, the, the captains um, of the boat that we use most frequently, uh, berthed their boat here at Moss Landing. I'm talking about Brian Bailey and the whole crew of um, the Steelhead and also the crew of the Marlin who are up in uh, Berkeley. These are my team. Um, they are fantastic divers and scientists and um, observers underwater. And so um, this talk is co-authored by all of them. And what I'd like to speak about first off is a large marine heat wave that has come and impacted Northern California. And this is a new word that's coming into our uh, language here. And the marine heat waves really have now been defined by uh, both the extent and the uh, spatial extent and the extreme of heat which is happening in the water. And so what you can see on this graph is that the ocean and the land are really getting quite warm, right? Um, so the definition that Alastair Hobde has given us is that it's going to be happening for more than five days greater than the 90th percentile of the long-term mean. There's that uh, long-term mean and uh, importance of time series again uh, and large spatial extent. And so what I'm going to be talking to you about is how this has really impacted our system here, how it has triggered a regime shift or a phase shift, 
how it's led to kelp deforestation, um, and how it's been impacting our uh, fishery productivity. But of course, there are a lot of other impacts in the dark blue that I won't be talking about today. So marine heat waves have happened uh, just recently in our uh, world, and we have a few really great examples of them. Um, in the Mediterranean, in the Northwest Atlantic, and in Australia. In Australia, uh, on the western coast, there was an extreme uh, heat wave which closed down abalone fisheries and uh, lobster fisheries. And there's been a recent paper on the impacts in Tasmania, uh, in Australia, also on how marine heat waves have impacted their kelp forests. And you can see from the graph that as it gets warmer and warmer, you're seeing less and less kelp. So this is the Tasmanian example that Alastair Hobday talks about. He's looking at the duration of events, the intensity of the heat, and you can see that over on the east coast of Tasmania, those uh, warm water anomalies are just hot, hot, hot. Um, same things have been happening in Oahu. We had a heat wave that Cox described, uh, which led to a lot of loss of marine life here. And so today what I'd like to talk about with that background is um, I'd like to first call out and say we did experience a marine heat wave, and I'd like to give you some evidence for, uh, for my claim that what we saw was a marine heat wave. And then I'd like to talk about some of the other uh, big impacts that have happened along our coast. One of them is a harmful algal bloom that happened in Northern California in 2011 before the heat wave. The other is the sea star die-off, which happened uh, right around 2013, 2014. Again, just a precursor to that heat wave, and then we've had heat. Then I'll talk a little bit about heat waves and CO2 and the evil twin of ocean acidification. So uh, ecosystems are something that we think of as being fairly stable. When I go diving um, in Northern California, I, I feel like I should know what to expect when I go there. And when you have a phase shift or uh, as they used to call it when I was in graduate school, alternative stable states. Um, now we're talking about tipping points, it's the same thing. Uh, there are these nonlinear dynamics, abrupt large scale changes in the ecosystem. Um, and one example would be a kelp forest to an urchin barrens. So this is what I'm gonna give you evidence for uh, in Northern California. So the region uh, can look like a very species-rich <laughs> area on the left, and then on the right it can also look like an urchin barrens. Um, in the past, there have been descriptions of this sort of mosaic of uh, patches that have changed to urchin <laughs> barrens, but not very large-scale changes. And what we're seeing today are, are very large-scale uh, changes in, in the system. And so I've coined this um, sort of a perfect storm of impacts to the North Coast. Uh, as I said, we've had some before the marine heat wave, and then we've had the warm blob and the El Nino that followed it, as well as this purple sea urchin population explosion. So if you add all these things up together, what you're gonna get is a perfect storm of uh, ecosystem impacts which do not favor kelp. So this is what we're seeing on the north coast. We're seeing areas that are normally rich in bull kelp forest where the birds are walking across the tops of the uh, kelp, and this is what we're seeing now. Kelp is really absent from many of these uh, important kelp bed areas. It all started in 2011 before the heat wave where we got a bad red tide which turned out to be a, uh, an organism that spit out yezotoxin. The yezotoxin 
killed marine invertebrates, including abalone, gumbu chitons, sea stars, and they all washed up dead on the beach. These are actually all abalone meats washed up on the beach with some gumbu chitons thrown in. And if you look on the side there, you see the meats in closer water, and it started in 2011 uh, towards the end of August. After the uh, harmful algal bloom, uh, we also had some sea star um, mortality during the HAB, but we also had the, uh, the extent of this mortality was almost exclusively in Sonoma County. It almost followed county lines, uh, about 100 kilometers of coastline, just north of Point Reyes. Um, we wouldn't have really known that this was occurring if we didn't have some very nice long-term monitoring sites. Here are the sites that Fish and Wildlife monitors routinely. We've got um, five in Sonoma County and five um, up in Mendocino County, and then there's one uh, or two MPAs in there. And we were able to go in there after the HAB jump back on the boats. The HAB event happened right at the end of the field season where I was looking forward to um, staying warm and dry and, and maybe watching a TV show. And instead, we jumped back on the boats and uh, went out and found that about 25% of the abalone had been killed in this uh, harmful algal bloom. The abalone were obviously dead. Here's a picture of a live one on the left, and right next door the neighbor died. And we did a lot of work looking at the uh, whole transcriptome, both before this mortality event and after the mortality event. We were able to identify that this was um, toxin. It also impacted the urchin maybe even more, closer to 35, 40% of all the urchin in the area died, and there were more dead in shallow than in the deeper water. Uh, in the shallows, the toxin uh, and the waves brought it in and, and killed them. So if we switch gears now from that first impact to the second, which is sea star wasting disease, we had that come through our system. Uh, Pycnopodia, the big sunflower stars, were very abundant in the system um, before sea star wasting disease, and now they are really absent. Uh, this summer, we s I saw one uh, small individual, the whole, uh, all of our cruises for all of our divers. So um, they're really absent from Sonoma and Mendocino County. Um, so we've had this uh, sea star wasting disease, um, and as some of you know, um, there have been some suggestions that this might have been caused by a denso virus, uh, but in any case, it happened before the warm water, um, and I think we're still trying to figure out what went, went on. Um, it even killed the most hardy of the stars, which are the bat stars, and now our system looks very different. Uh, today, we have a system that's dominated by um, leather and bat stars, and we're seeing very few of the other stars um, in our system, uh, with the exception of we've been seeing quite a few leptosterias. So we're working with Sarah Cohn to uh, look at the genetics of that. So the sea stars went way down um, at all of our sites, and in contrast, the purple urchins went way up. So we are now seeing 60 times what I'm used to seeing for purple urchin densities. Um, so we have very high numbers of purple urchins uh, all the way from Central California all the way up into Washington State. Um, and I'm trying to get some uh, information from southern British Columbia to see if they're also experiencing these purple urchin booms. So um, what I have on the bottom panel is across the years are our normal numbers for purple urchin, and now we're getting upwards of 15 per meter square along a 60 meter uh, square transect. 
Um, and you can see that that has happened at the same time as these warm water spikes in 2014 and 2015. Uh, so the top panel is temperature, and towards the end of that record, you can see that we've gotten some high numbers there. Now, we also had some fairly warm water in 97, but we didn't have purple urchins going crazy like they are now. So purple urchins are way up. Um, the 2016 numbers are even higher. Um, in some places, we've got um, purple urchin that look like this. Um, we've got size frequency distributions in, uh, these are 2015 data showing that we've got small animals um, coming into these populations. Um, and if you look just at Van Dam, this is, these are data from the top 2015, 2016, 2017. Even into 2017, we're still getting very, oops, sorry, we're still getting very small animals. Um, which are, I'm not pressing this right, small animals in that very uh, last panel in the 20 and 30 millimeter size range. So those could be uh, one or two year olds, um, even in these very low food conditions. Red urchins have also increased in densities, um, but not anywhere near to the densities that purples are, but 2016-2017 um, numbers for red urchin are also very high, but they are empty inside. In other words, there's no gonad, they're of zero value to the fishery. A uh, few urchins are starting to so show some signs of disease or stress, but we still haven't seen that as being very common. This is a red Franciscanus, um, but so here is what we're seeing um, routinely. Um, we're seeing this coralline algae. The abalone are very flat and starved and thin. And as you're swimming these transects, it's um, very common to see these kinds of densities of urchin. You can see that there's very little fleshy algae around. And you can see even the uh, coralline algae is being eaten away, and normally what would be pink rock uh, all across the substrate there, you're starting to see um, other rock. This is a live abalone, um, which is plastered to the substrate because it's very, very thin. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, these conditions are impacting two of our important uh, commercial fisheries, one commercial red sea urchin and one recreational, which actually um, has a non-market value of upwards of $44 million a year to the north coast. So without kelp, these herbivores are in very bad shape. And um, what we're seeing is that uh, both of these fisheries are really um, getting hammered. So to the right, is an urchin cracked open with the uh, gonad, which is the marketed uh, portion of the urchin, and it's usually a plump, uh, bright orange color like that, but when we open up urchin, they're completely empty right now, so they're uh, not worth anything to the fishery. The average um, catch has been going down for uh, red sea urchin, and you can see that after the poor kelp, um, it's plummeted. Uh, in 2017, the red urchin divers are now filing for federal disaster relief because uh, 2016 numbers were even worse than 2015. So if I switch gears now and focus on the recreationally important red abalone, you can see that this abalone is quite fat and tall, um, and that was what it looked like at the beginning of this poor kelp time. You can see in the back empty pteragophora stalks. There's no blades, but that animal is still fat and healthy looking in terms of body condition. But what we had is a series 
of bad years. We had warm water blob for two years in a row, followed by southern waters coming up being warm from an El Nino in 2016. And this combination of uh, one, two, three punch has really taken a toll on abalone. So you can see on the far right, abalone meats are shrunken way down uh, past the extent of their shell. They look like little hamburger patties. They're behaving in very weird ways, climbing up stalks, we're calling these lollipops, trying to get to the pteragophora fronds at the top, which are non-existent. This year, we're not even seeing those pteragophora stalks. We're just seeing um, tons of red abalone shell. We're seeing starved abalone that are plastered flat to the substrate, and again, hordes of urchin. On the left-hand panel is a dying abalone, and that's the inside meat. And those uh, urchin and bat stars are in there eating the meat. So last year, Fish and Game Commission uh, changed the regulations, reduced the season to five months, reduced the bag limit, but that has done nothing uh, to stop what's going on in the environment. So we've seen a lot of mortality of individuals. And in fact, if we look at all of our density data, we're seeing that the numbers of dead abalone in our surveys are usually less than 1%. And right now, at some spots, 67% of all the abalone that we saw in one of these very important recreational fishery sites, Casper Cove, 67% were dead shells. So we're seeing, uh, on average, 37% of all the abalone in our surveys in 2017 were dead. Looking not just at lethal effects, but looking at sublethal effects, we are seeing huge impacts to abalone health. So we have shrinkage scores from the left to the right. The left is a zero score, which is a normal uh, abalone, which is fat and healthy. Then we're starting to get progressively less healthy and we're seeing shrinkage scores of one, twos, and threes throughout our fishery. We sampled 6,000 animals in 2016 and more than 6,000 animals in 2017, even though the slide says 3,000. Uh, we saw that of the abalone that the fishermen were taking, more than 25% of them were shrunken. So the abalone fishermen are going for the fattest and healthiest animals, and even within that pool, more than 25% are shrunken. So here are the surveys from 2017 and the shrinkage scores. All these pie graphs should all be white. We never see shrunken abalone, but what you'll see is that many of the abalone um, and if you look at some of the ones down, am I pushing this wrong? You'll see that down in the south, um, half of them were shrunken. And again, these are animals that were taken by the fishery. We have this strange interaction now, a synergism between ocean warming and the fishery. The animals have left the deep water Typically, a third are in the deep. Now, they're all in shallow. Um, they're usually in crevices. Now, they're all out searching for food. Um, and the fishermen are selecting these few fat abalone. So the abalone are much more vulnerable to the fishery because of these climate changes and these ecosystem impacts. And I'll be giving a talk on this <coughs> at WSN. The second sublethal <coughs> impact that we're looking at is reproduction. On the left is a fat normal um, gonad. On the right is a very shrunken gonad. And we've uh, recorded the worst gonad scores ever, both in 2016 
2016 and 2017. We know from our work in the lab that uh, temperature and food quantity and quality all impact the gonad scores. And so we know that these warm waters, which are shown in the uh, left, uh, on the right hand side there, are all uh, impacting the numbers of mature oocytes that the females are going to be producing. If we take a look at the abalone that are in the larval or the villager stage in the wild, and we take a look at the abalone that are newly settled, less than a millimeter in <coughs> size, again in the wild, um, we've developed some methods for sampling these uh, very small, um, small life history stages. And uh, looking at the uh, villagers, so we're trying to capture larvae in the ocean, and yes, it's a needle in a haystack, but when you have a son who's really strong, you just make him drag the plankton net through the water, and he can just do that all day long because he has too much energy. So uh, we just make him drag the plankton net all the way through the water all day long, and then we sort the samples, and we find the larvae, and we see that the last good larvae year was 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016. We've had no larvae in our samples. Uh, we haven't counted our 2017 samples yet. That's for these rainy days or when we're home. Uh, we can also look at the very newly settled abalone, and they uh, are present on crustose coral and covered cobbles and rocks, um, which is shown on the right. So the divers put these in Ziploc bags, we bring them back, we sort them for newly settled abalone, less than a millimeter, so typically around 400 uh, to 600 microns and we're able to capture these newly settled abalone. We can see that um, 15 and 16 we had zeros, 14 we had very few, and again 13 was um, a, a good or normal year for newly settled abalone on these boulders. So with these data showing that there are 37% uh, of all the abalone we found were dead, that the uh, abalone are starving, and that 25% of the catch was starving, that we're getting very little reproduction, that gonad scores are terrible. We went to the Fish and Game Commission, uh, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife recommended uh, fishery closure at the August meeting. It's a three-meeting process. There's a discussion meeting in October, the commission also heard from fishermen who would like to keep the fishery open, and the decision meeting will be December 6th and 7th down in San Diego. So if you're interested, we, I can tell you more about the decision process. So moving away from uh, management and back to what were some of these underlying stressors, uh, clearly we had these warm water conditions and you can see that in the far left panel, uh, in 2011, we had some nice cool water hugging the north coast, uh, northern California coastal areas just above San Francisco, that uh, dark blue ridge there, um, moving into the warm water blob, which is the definition that Nick Vaughn coined um, and he was talking about the ridiculously resilient ridge of, of warm water up in the Gulf of Alaska that dipped down into our region. Um, and it was persisting um, throughout 2014, 2015. And then we got a strong El Nino in 2016 and 2015 coming up from the south. So we've had a lot of very, very warm water in our area, and um, the warm water meets the definition for a marine heat wave uh, that Alistair Hobday gave us. And how does this impact our kelp? So we see this warm water stress 
and we look at the Department of Fish and Wildlife kelp flyover data. Um, and the way I've organized these images is in the columns. So the 2008 column goes from the north in Mendocino down to Fort Ross in Sonoma County. And you can see that the green is the kelp that's normally at the surface. That's the bull kelp. 2014, 2015, 2016, we really have very little uh, kelp canopy cover. Uh, so you might say, well, temperatures seem to fluctuate in different years, and we'll get back some nice cool water, which we may. Uh, 2017 looks like we are getting some nice cooler water this year, but we remember we also have those hordes of urchin, which um, are down there. So the bull kelp uh, has to survive the gametophytic stage, the sporophytic stage, and then has to grow. Um, what do you have here in Monterey? I have only been diving here uh, a little bit in October, but from John Pierce's front porch, we can see that kelp is absent from south of Hopkins. We can see that if you go around the corner to a little bit to the north of where this picture is taken, um, there is kelp present, but down at Lovers and Point Pinos where we were diving um, off of the steelhead, kelp was really absent. So it seems to be much more patchy around here. Um, and then there seems to be some bull kelp down around the Silomar. So we'll see what's happening in the Monterey area. If you move further north up into Puget Sound, this is uh, Tom Mumford's work. He's showing a big decline in the kelp, particularly down uh, in the in the south of the sound there. And remember that bull kelp is an annual, so it has to um, come back every year and grow that long hold fast and grow up. And so um, it's really going to depend on those spores and the gametophytic stages, and it's got to get past these hordes of purple urchin. So I think this makes bull kelp recovery a little bit different than, say, macrocystis um, recovery. So um, we seem to be at this tipping point, um, and the uh, hungry urchins may be feeding into this negative feedback loop where we're getting fewer and fewer blades that have the sore eye on them, and uh, we may be getting uh, less and less recruitment. And as I showed in the video, we're starting to see, which we did not see in 15 and 16, large areas of the coralline are being eaten away by the urchin. And when we did dissected the purple urchin to do gonad, we also did gut contents. And what we're seeing is a lot of coralline and rock in the guts of these urchin. So switching gears away from ocean warming, uh, we've done a little bit of work thinking about ocean acidification in these systems. And um, these are just some of the graphs showing that um, as we get more CO2, we're going to be getting more acidic waters. And this is the work I've collaborated with Jennifer uh, O'Leary on. Um, she was at Hopkins and now is down at Cal Poly. We're working with Paul Gabrielson because he's one of the few people who actually knows which corallines are which. I do not. <laughs> they look like pink crusts to me. I write pink crust. Um, Paul's taught me to look for conceptacles and what the flowing edges of the corallines look like, so I write that down, but I have no idea what species it is. Is it lithophyllum? Is it leptophyte? I don't know. So we're leaving that to Paul. We're looking at these morphological groupings and hopefully he's making some sense of them. Maybe the morphology is helpful for which species is which, maybe it's not. So what Jennifer did was she had these different treatments of PCO2 and was able to look at whether abalone are going to settle on corallines which have been exposed to these different levels of ocean acidification. And what 
she found is that um, the species of corallin um, really dictates how much the abalone are going to be settling. So abalone know which species are which. I don't, but they do. And she also found that um, with the ocean acidification, with having exposed those crustose corallins to the ocean acidified waters for four months, then taking them and putting them in normal water, that the larvae were still able to settle no problem. So that previous uh, acidic history for the crustose corallins really had very little impact on uh, the settlement cue to those um, abalone larvae. So even at high and very high uh, ocean acidification levels. So um, in contrast, the crusts themselves, the corallins themselves, really had very large impacts to their growth um, depending on their history of exposure. So the controls grew much better than those that were ex exposed to high and extreme values of acidified waters. So, and that too was um, species specific. So some of these crusts are what we call fast growing, and I mean fast for a crust, which is slow. But some of them are very slow growing. So those seem to be um, impacted as well. So where does that bring us all? Uh, we really have quite an uncertain future. Um, I would hate to be able to uh, give you a prediction as to what next year's um, seawater temperatures would be like, but I can give you a prediction about what next year's abalone numbers will be like. Right now, we have no kelp to speak of. We have um, tons of purple sea urchins, and so we are going to continue to get abalone mortality um, on the North Coast. Um, what is going to happen to the purple urchins? Are we going to see some disease cropping up because of these very, very high numbers? I don't know. That's a possibility. Um, so we don't really know. Um, in this slide, it's talking about um, the marine heat wave. What we do think may happen in climate change is that we may experience more um, marine heat waves. We may experience these heat waves lasting for longer periods of time. And we may experience more extreme heat waves. So the heat may be really hot. Um, and so what we need to do, I think, as scientists is to continue to think about uh, what these will do to our systems. Um, they may have very surprising consequences. For example, this interaction between the warm water and the fishery. So that warm water is moving all those abalone into shallow areas. The fishermen are only allowed to free dive, so they are mostly fishing in shallow areas. Um, the Food shortages are forcing the abalone out of the crevices where the fishermen can easily see them. So these strange interactions between the warming and the vulnerability to the fishery may start uh, cropping up, and I think it's something we're going to need to keep our eyes on. Um, just as a, an aside, we've had in the last three years um, five record red abalones captured. So those are the largest red abalone that have ever been captured. They make it to the top 10 list. And surprisingly, five of them have been in the last few years out of the top 15. Um, and then we went for 15 years where we had no records broken in the past. So these kinds of interactions between ocean warming and fisheries uh, may persist. So um, we've had unprecedented changes in the marine uh, communities on the North Coast. Um, and I think we 
we've had them in the Mediterranean, as I pointed out in the intro, in Australia and Hawaii. Um, Theo McKelly, working at Hopkins, is seeing some very large uh, changes in the oxygen levels in Baja, California, where she's working with some of the fishing cooperatives. She's seeing extreme low oxygen events. And so um, we're now getting excited about putting out some of these mini dot oxygen sensors um, up and down some of our sites. So we've just downloaded one um, last week. So we'll have to tell you. Stay tuned for some of those data. Um, and my plug for uh, making sure that we keep monitoring because without knowing what it used to look like, you can't say what the change has been. So um, with our program that started in 2000, um, we're able to say that since 2000, we haven't seen what we're seeing now. And I think that makes for some powerful statements. Um, the other thing is that some of the folks in my lab are thinking about developing partnerships that will be to research uh, the potential resilience of bull kelp. Um, Cynthia Catton's been working on developing these uh, partnerships and thinking about projects that we might do to uh, maybe do some pilot urchin removals or look at some of the earlier life histories and how temperatures impacting bull kelp. So she's been working on this uh, partnership that we're calling Kelper. And if anyone's interested in um, exploring some of the work that we're doing, we're looking uh, to develop this partnership. We're looking for some apps that we're gonna work with uh, that the general public can use to record when they see kelp and when they don't. So with all of that, I would like to thank you all and take some questions. Yes. I work with a lot of local divers who are very aware and very concerned about the spread of purple urchins around Monterey Peninsula and Carmel and, and then can those contributing to the loss of kelp forests. And a lot of some of these divers have even approached me about should we implement a urchin removal program or start killing them or whatever, and so I'm just curious of what your opinion would be on people starting to manipulate the urchin environment um, in such a way to maybe take the stress off of the kelp. So, um, Fish and Wildlife Code says that we shall not waste seafood resources. There's a wastage clause. So we really don't, um, you know, against the law to just go out and harvest a bunch of fish and just leave them to die, right? Mm. So um, that's something that we want to be aware of. Um, the other thing is that, you know, um, when crown of thorn stars started taking over and munching on coral reefs in Australia, divers went out and chopped them up. <laughs> well, what happens when you chop up a star? They get three. Right? So if we start smashing purple urchin and it's winter time and they're reproductive, maybe we're just facilitating reproduction. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to see you know, what might be effective, what might be appropriate. Um, so a lot of folks are really um, anxious to get going right now. But I think there's a lot of science that we have to do first to see, you know, what might be feasible and, and effective. You know, we haven't had a whole lot of luck changing what's going on on these broad spatial scales in the ocean. Because, you know, even, even my whole dive team, we went out, we did a small plot, 10 meter circle, and in four days, you could barely tell we had been so we want to do things, but we want to do things that might be really effective. Um, 
with some sort of apps that we develop, I think would be really the first step. Mm -hmm. When you uh, when you start to notice the cold cap die out, if there's warm water. Yes. Did you see a related changes in the understory just due to warm water? Yes. Absolutely. The short reds. Everything was and starting to really die. And that was before the urchins recruited in. Yeah. Urchins are amazing critters. <laughs> so the other question I have is, do you think you kind of associate the urchins are all this thing with warm water, but if it's a big deal about urchin improvement, how did ocean circulation change in, in any way that might affect larval survivorship and recruitment? Do you have any information about that? I think that's a great question. Um, Presumably, you know, if you've got some relaxation events happening, then you're going to have some, uh, maybe some gyre set up behind headlands. You know, you may be in certain areas promote, there may be areas that promote settlement. Um, and I was kind of looking at that, looking at headlands versus coves, and we were seeing urchin everywhere. Um, you know, they're not like abalone. Abalone settle right on crustose corallines. Urchin don't care if it's a bacterial film, they'll settle. So they'll settle, you know, anywhere. So, but that's a really important question, I think. Um, Steve Schroeder's been doing stuff for many years on scrub brushes, looking at settlement. And he says he didn't see huge pulses, but he's only got one site Northern California. So I don't know whether they missed it or I don't know. Great question. John. So you showing that uh, most of these events that we're worried about, the harmful algal, the uh, sea stars, diel, the urchin settling, those can happen before the warming. So how long does the warming connected to those events? I think that it's multiple stressors, right? So, you know, you you go out, you twist your ankle, okay? And then you go out and um, something else happens, and then something else happens. Well, twisted ankle, you're gonna be fine, but when you've had these three or four uh, big events, then that's when the system starts to come to that tipping point. But those events, uh, we don't have a correlation of what might have been behind those events. No, no idea. <laughs> and they may be totally unrelated, right? Yeah. <laughs> Except for that that ecosystem that's experiencing them has just had one after another. And that's why I think we haven't seen this in the past. You know, you could say, well, how come how come in 97 we didn't get hordes of purple urchin? Well, because maybe we didn't have these series of stressors. I don't know. Yes. Has there been any monitoring on how the sessile invertebrate community has changed as response to all these things? Yeah, you know, um, anecdotally, when we first saw some of the kelp dying off, we got a, you might have had it here, we got a big barnacle settlement. Yeah. And we had barnacles coating a lot of surfaces. They were on top of urchin, they were on top of rock, they were even on pteranophora stalks. Um, and those have all been munched away by the urchin. So, um, when we do those boulder samples, we're looking for newly settled abalone, but we also encounter newly settled mollusks of, I don't even know what they all are. One of them I love because it looks just like a little peppermint. It's pink and white striped. I don't know what it is, but it's about the same size as an abalone, but it looks like a peppermint. <laughs> they are gone too. All those other little critters, when we look at those boulder samples from 2016, 2017, we sorted them like that because there was like nothing. So I really 
appreciate that you've been monitoring that relatively large area for a long time. Um, some of those um, symptoms that you talked about have been seen in other parts of the West Coast. Have you been able to uh, talk with your colleagues north and south to see if there's any trend in there or is, is there enough or monitoring to see that? So the kelp forest monitoring program started in the early 80s um, and they've been monitoring the northern channel islands at like 16 sites um, and they've been seeing all kinds of things but none that look like what we've seen. So they're seeing a huge absence in sea stars, they're seeing a small decline in kelp, um, they're not seeing a lot of abalone but they didn't have a lot either. Um, so the different parts of the state may be doing something a little differently, which is why I think Monterey area is going to be very interesting. Um, and Oregon, there's very little work going on in the rocky shores of Oregon. Um, yeah. yes. What are the are, are, or are there big differences that you've seen since Cynthia Catton's kind of initial write-up of this issue with the perfect storm, I think, is maybe how a lot of people wound up getting introduced to this as a thing that's happening. Have there been big shifts since then, or is it sort of more of the same? It's way worse than yeah. we guessed. When we drafted okay. perfect storm, we were saying, here are some uh, big impacts to the kelp forest. Uh, we spoke to the Fishing Game Commission and said, heads up getting all these things, we did not expect to go out in 2017 and see 37% of all the abalone are dead. That was, you know, that was our worst nightmare, was that all, was that we were right and that everything was doing very bad. Growth um, and another area off 
San Diego looks like we've had very nice growth of those animals. So we're trying to learn as much as we can, but uh, we're going to be paying a lot of attention to our surveys of those sites where we um, not only record substrate, but algal canopy cover and algal cover in general. Has there been any noticeable change in sea star recruitment? Like, is there any sign of sea star wasting abating or changing? Or sea star wasting? Yeah, I guess specifically the you know sunflower stars that are the primary predators. I saw one this whole summer okay. yeah. on the whole boat with all the divers. Um, I know Mark Carr is trying to do an experiment with. Um, sunflower stars, and he didn't have enough to do the experiment with. So now it's a Germisterius experiment. Um, it's switching to Germisterius. Germisterius, yeah. So, great. Okay, well, let's go ahead. 